When I was growing up in our young people's songbook, there was this song which I could never sing. It was an Isaac Watts song. It was the Ten Commandments in short rhyme for kids. I made up my own tune to it because I wanted to sing it. Thou shalt have no more gods but me, before no idol bow thy knee. Take not the name of God in vain, nor dare the Sabbath day profane. Give both thy parents honor due, take heed that thou no murder do. Abstain from words and deeds unclean, nor steal, though thou art poor and mean. Nor make a willful lie, nor love it, what is thy neighbor's dare not. Covet. That's the wrong tune. <laughs> I thought that the first commandment dealt with exclusivity. Based on the words, thou shalt have no more gods but me, God is saying, in this marriage, this is a monogamous relationship. It's all about worshiping and worshiping me. No more gods except. The but means except. No gods but me. And I call that the exclusivity of the relationship. Exclude all others and worship me alone. And when Jesus was being tempted by the devil, he said to the devil, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. So he was saying this exclusive relationship is important. I want to go to the second command. In my version, before no idol, bow thy knee. If you look at the Exodus chapter 20 version, it is probably the longest exposition of the commandment. That and the fourth commandment about the Sabbath. So to summarize it in eight syllables is probably not doing justice to it. So the summary concept I say there is idolatry. And we have to get our mind around what idolatry actually is. In many religions, they made idols. I could just fast forward to golden calf and say enough said. When Moses went up on the mountain and he was taking too long, the people murmured against him and they told his brother, we need something to worship. They got all the jewelry that they pilfered was offered to them by the Egyptians. And they made an idol, a golden calf, for them to worship. Because in Egypt, that's what people did. They worshipped stuff, idols. And other nations also worshipped idols. So they said, hey, Moses is gone. He's not coming back. They're watching the clock saying, okay, where's Moses? 40 days? He's probably not coming back. Let's make an idol. And they made this idol. Do you have any idols in your life? Don't say no, because we all have idols. Our job and our family and our stuff and our bank account, all idols. And the question is, do we turn our attention to them? Just as the people saw the other nations worshiping idols, the idols existed. You can choose not to worship the idol. And that's what God is saying. You will see idols all around you. You will see other nations with their idols. And you will even have some of your own idols. Just don't worship them. If we are harsh with ourselves, we are more likely to see the fault their brutus lies in us. This is not in our stars. We will then recognize that there are things in our life that need attention. And then we ask that question, is this idol being worshipped? So I want you to think about the things in your life that are worthy of your attention. Usually it's like a, a hobby or something that you have there set aside. You cherish this thing. People play with this little toy or whatever. It's an idol. The question is, do you worship it? Do you give it so much attention that you take time that you could be giving to God and you focus on this thing? Now, I'm not saying to get rid of your toys, but I'm saying ask yourself the question. Is it getting so much of my attention that that attention could be used more for God's glory? Idols. Commandment number three. I call this the most misunderstood commandment. Take not the name of God in vain. And most people think of this and they think of using profane language. But that's not what it's about at all. It is about the name. The name. Remember earlier he had asked God, what should I tell the people is the name? What is your name? And God told him, the name. And I said the Jews don't even mention it. The name. What does he mean when he says, don't take the name of God in vain? I'm going to read a few verses from Leviticus to give you a sense of where that is going. Leviticus chapter 18, verse 21. God says, do not give any of your children to be sacrificed to Molech, for you must not profane my name. Don't sacrifice your children, because in doing so you're profaning my name. I am the Lord your God. Leviticus 19, verse 12. Do not swear falsely by my name. Do not profane my name. What's the definition of profane? Excellent question. Profane. To treat something that is holy with disrespect or irreverence. To desecrate, to defile, or to treat sacrilegiously. Do not profane my name. So, in offering your children to idols, 
He said, you are profaning my name. And swearing falsely, using my name, you are profaning my name. I will set my face against those who sacrifice their children to Molech. They defile my sanctuary and profane my holy name. They must be holy to their God and must not profane the name of their God. They present food offerings to the Lord, the food of their God. They must present it in a holy manner, for they are to be holy. Tell Aaron and his sons to treat the name with respect, to treat with respect the sacred offerings the Israelites are consecrating, so that they will not profane my holy name. Leviticus 22, verse 32. Do not profane my holy name, for I must be acknowledged as holy by the Israelites. I am the Lord who made you holy. So the idea is that the name is holy. Don't use the name in any way that would desecrate the name or disrespect the name or be irreverent or defile the name or be sacrilegious. God wasn't thinking about people swearing in a contemporary sense. He was thinking about revering the name, the name that was not called. So don't use the name because you, you swear by something higher than you in court. The evidence I shall give, so help me God. You swear by something higher than you. and you, If you swear by God, you're swearing by the highest level of authority. So if you swear and you lie, that's the swearing that we talk about. Not swearing using profane language, bad language, but swearing, making an oath, and calling on the name of God as a signatory, a stamp of approval that what you're saying is true. And then you lie. The punishment for profaning the name of God, very quickly. Leviticus chapter 24. The son of the Israelite woman blasphemed the name. So they brought him to Moses. And Moses says, anyone who blasphemes the name shall be put to death. The entire assembly must stone him. When you blaspheme the name, you are to be put to death. So it's not about loose language. I dare say, sometimes we think of God in a casual way. But if we revere him the way he ought to be revered, we would not blaspheme. Because we're going to say, what is sacred will not be desecrated. And I will not participate in any desecration. Which means we need to be careful about how we are living our lives. How we are communicating with and about God. To make sure that we do not desecrate or blaspheme his name. Commandment number four. I want to say it's kind of self-evident, but maybe not. Because times have changed. And some of us are old enough to know when the stores were closed. And you went to church several times on a Sunday. And even if you didn't go to church, you were very quiet. And you thought about God. If you couldn't make it to church, you dedicated that time and that space to God. Unless you were in an essential services where it was mandated that you work, then it was a day of rest. But it's not just rest. It is rest and worship. Which is why we assemble and we offer God an offering of praise and thanksgiving and whatever other offerings we bring, including physical offerings. But... It was set aside and it's supposed to be set aside for this purpose. Once every seven days. But it's also the Sabbath once every seven years. And the promise he was offering here was not about what was happening in year one of the Exodus. It was looking forward to year 40 when they cross into that land and they claim the land. Because it was a land grant promise too. You will not desecrate the land. And then seven Sabbaths, the year of Jubilee. Another great going on there that we cannot identify with because we live in a contemporary world where we don't take Sabbaths. And that's a conversation I don't want to stir right now. Should we rest on Saturday and worship on Sunday, the first day of the week versus the seventh day? I don't want to open that can of worms because there are many arguments that can be had about that. But the idea of Sabbath, it is about resting from our work. That's what the elaboration says. Rest, resting, to focus on God. Nature abhors a vacuum. So you don't just pull work out and put nothing there. You replace the work with worship. And that is the idea that was being promulgated there. I could probably stop there and then go into more detail, study on those four. Number five is about honoring your parents. And that gets a little dicey. One of the questions I have on the handout relate to, if your parents have not exactly done right by you, what does that honor look like? And if you don't know them, because you were born and they were gone in some way, do you honor the biological parent or the adoptive parent or the person who raised you in lieu of a parent? And then the next five relate to relations to people on the lateral level. So in my version of things, don't murder. I love what Jesus did with that. If you're angry with your brother, 
Jesus raised the bar really, really high. You're thinking, oh, I haven't killed anybody. No. Did you get angry with anybody? That's murder in Jesus' eyes. Man, I'm guilty. Have you gotten angry with anyone in the past week or month? Jesus is saying, you know, that's what the commandment is speaking to. So you have a list of don'ts, but you have to raise it from do not do to here's what you do instead. So don't work on the Sabbath. What you do instead is worship. Don't get angry. Instead, love. He told one of the guys, love your neighbor as yourself. And then in the Sermon on the Mount, what did he say? Love your enemies. Don't just love your neighbor. Love your enemies. So he's raising the bar really, really, really high. Which means on our own, it's impossible to meet the standard. I don't know. For me, it's impossible. Without his help and without that covering of grace, there's no way I could make that standard. I'm not going to pretend that I don't murder anyone because Jesus said, you see murder, but I see anger. And anger is the appropriate replacement for murder. The next one in the Bible focuses on adultery. And you have thoughts about what adultery is. In Watts' little song, it says, abstain from words and deeds unclean. So because it's written for children, adultery is not the appropriate word. So he replaces it with words and deeds unclean. But how does Jesus even approach that subject? He says, if you look at somebody of the other gender and you have thoughts, that's adultery. That's the high standard. So a magazine or television show or something, a billboard, and you're looking and you're thinking. As long as you're thinking, hmm, in Jesus' eyes, that's adultery. Who can abide by these standards? They're so high. Keep going. Nor steal. Guilty. Because I'm sure that this pen was issued by my work, and I have it here in my possession. And there are lots of pens at my work issues that end up at my house. And I keep thinking, use the ones at the house. Don't go take another one just because it's there. <laughs> Office supplies. I once watched a guy take a whole ream of paper and stick it in his bag. He says, I'm doing the school work, so I'm taking the paper home. <laughs> Ouch, I wouldn't dare do that. But Nor steal. But I'm sure that Jesus has another standard for that too. And it's not taking stuff. It is more than that. I haven't researched that one. Number nine, false witness. That sounds like in a court or in a trial. You are saying, oh yeah, he did it. I know he did it when you are actually lying. So that was the absolute standard that was offered. Do not give false testimony against your neighbor. What Watt says in his version is, don't make a willful lie and enjoy making that lie. Nor make a willful <laughs> lie nor love it. If somebody asks me why I have this pen at my church, here's what I'm going to say. <laughs> I'm conniving the willful lie about why I don't buy a separate pen for church and keep the one for work at work. I'm saying that the standard is high, and we cannot actually maintain this without God's help. And the last one says, it is a longer one. In the Exodus version, it says, you shall not covet your neighbor's house, which is interesting because they didn't have houses. They were just out of the... Egyptian enslavement, and they're at the mountain, so don't come at your neighbor's house. It's looking forward. In the Deuteronomy version, 40 years later, it starts with, do not covet your neighbor's wife. If you grew up Catholic, you know that the coveting is actually commands 9 and 10. The Catholics split number 9 because they don't have number 2. Number 2 is idolatry. I want to call it idolatry. Bow into any idol. So that does not appear in the Catholic version of the Ten Commandments. You probably know that if you were raised Catholic. Uh, I'm not even going to touch that with a ten-foot pole right now, so <laughs> we can talk about that later. But they split number ten into nine and ten. Coveting your neighbor's wife, coveting your neighbor's stuff. As Protestants, we put it all together, and we say, what is your neighbor's do not covet? And how do you even define coveting? If you desire something somebody else has, you're messing with fire. You're thinking, you know what, I admire that. So you can admire, but don't think thoughts of how can I get. My grandmother used to say, be contented with what you have, little be it or much. How to find contentment when other people have. And you think that God is not just because why is it that I don't have and this person has. But when you have two million people fresh out of slavery in Egypt, standing in the dust at the foot of Mount Sinai, it is not what we are thinking in 2018. However, we still have to think through it and ask, how does this Decalogue apply to us today? And it's mentioned three times, at least, in the original versions. 
But then it's mentioned in summary form. Love the Lord your God with your whole heart, all your strength, all your mind. And what on earth does that mean anyway? All your heart, soul, strength, and mind. How do you do that? And then love your neighbor, sorry, love your enemy. The same way you love yourself. Impossible standards. 